Hold on a second, technical, don't dock me the time. <laughs> I'm going to be flying through this because there's, there's a lot in here, guys. Um, so, let's see. Ah, there we go. So, Blacksburg, Virginia. Like, what the heck is in Blacksburg, Virginia, right? It's, it's, it's way down in southwest Virginia, and it's known for the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, for moonshine. That's, our, that's our, our, our claim to fame. So how the heck did we get a, a, one of the first passive house commercial buildings in, in the world in southwest Virginia? Well, um, in the Jewish tradition, we have something called tukun olam, or repairing or healing the world. And the idea was when they were, they were looking to build a new building for this Jewish Life Center, um, my partner in my business then knew the, the, the woman who ran this, and she, he said, look, if you really want to talk about tukun olam, You've got to think about carbon. And so that was pretty cool, right, that he did. That. And, they, and the organization um, has operated for many, many years in Blacksburg. It's never had a, a, hall, a home. It's always gone from one rented place to another. And um, this woman here, Diane, her husband passed away, and she donated the money to build this thing, um, which was really cool, except that was, that was our donation. That was what we had to build it for, and it was just standard construction cost. Right, so it was like $145 a square foot, roughly, is what we had to build it for, and we we're gonna build Passive House to that. And so not only would the Passive House repair the world, but allow for more programs to serve the students because the operating and maintenance costs would be significantly lower than the standard building. So they had the money for the building, but they would still have to raise money for operations and maintenance over time. So this building's actually using about 80% less than a, a building of this size would, would, work, would, would normally work. So here's the building. 745 meters, light timber construction. It's got a very complex usage pattern, and it's significantly different zoning requirements uh, in, in the HVAC on this building. Uh, there are two, two commercial kitchen exhaust hoods because, of course, it's a kosher kitchen. So we have a milk side and a meat side. Um, it's a mixed humid climate, meaning that we have challenges that they don't face in Germany. A very restricted budget of the nonprofit organization. So the first thing I had to do was I said to myself, you know, well, let's look at this building in detail. And so as I'm going through the passive house planning program, I'm looking at my occupancy pattern. And I realized that when I really graphed it out, this area of the, of the building was used most of the time, like 90% of the time. This area of the building was used hardly at all, right? So that started to inform our decisions as to where we could spend money and where we could save money. So what we did was we created this zone concept. So the Merkaz, or social office, this main area is used by students and staff um, up to about 20 hours a day. And, um, and uh, it's used pretty much you know, year round. It's a very simple occupancy for us to, to calculate. The sanctuary, which is this sec second piece here, it's a multi-purpose space. It can be divided into three, it's 3,000 square feet. It could be divided into three 1,000 square foot spaces or a 1,000 and a 2,000 or a full 3,000. Um, it, it basically is used weekly for services, uh, occasionally for Friday night dinners, and then plus some things like special functions and mu music and stuff like that. So it's got this really wild pattern. Like you can have zero people in there, 300. You can have two people in a room that's 1,000 square feet. I mean, so it's, it's gotta be very flexible. And that's a complex occupancy. And, and by the way, occupancy is just, these are things out of my brain. There, there's no real terms like this. And the kitchen is a functional area, uh, area that had to be used for preparation of their dinners. And that's special occupancy, meaning something that's not complex or simple. Now, the interesting part is here, when I got started in Passive House 10 years ago, there were two in the entire of North America and nothing commercial and no, no assemblies, nothing like that. So the first thing I did was I said, well, do, first question, does the kitchen go inside the envelope or outside the envelope? And the way I designed it, you know, it could be really easy outside the envelope. So I, first thing I did, get on my little computer machine and I asked my North American colleagues, of course nobody knew anything about it, so then I got on my computer machine and I asked the Germans and I got everything that I wanted to know, which is that the Germans don't care about us in North America and they'd never answered our emails. <laughs> so, so what I did instead was I looked at the, um, I looked online, right? What else would you do? I went down the inner tubes and I found schools, and schools have kitchens. So I reasoned, well, the Germans are putting the kitchens in their passive house, right? Because they show passive house schools, they show passive houses, schools with kitchens, so I just assumed, right? So I said, well, if the Germans can do it, I can do it. Well, it turns out, after I finished the whole thing, that this was the first one in the entire world that actually got built with it. That when I was in Germany on the bus with one of the German physicists, I said, 
you know, doing that kitchen was such a pain in the ass. I mean, we had all these problems. He goes, oh, you put the kitchen in the envelope? I said, yeah, we put it in the envelope. Don't you do that in your schools? He goes, oh, no, we never do this. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shoot. So, um, but the interesting thing was three months later, they contacted me and, and asked me for my engineering drawings because they, they said, well, if, no American, if American could do it, we better write it or do it. So now they're starting to put them in envelopes in, in Europe. Uh, one other thing to understand is that when you're trying to apply principles uh, of passive house to North America, and I was specifically in the USA, this does not apply to Canada, um, you know, Europe is quite different. There's a 15 degree delta for acceptable comfort range in, in, in Europe. So in the winter, you put on a sweater when it's cool, and in the summer, you wear light clothing, right? But in, in the US, specifically, in the winter time, you know, we want a temperature of like 72, and in the summertime, we want it to be like 70, right? So our comfort range acceptance versus the Europeans is quite different. So when we modeled the, did all the energy modeling for this, we had to keep that and understand that the passive house program that we were using to design this was made for European comfort standards. So we had to adjust the comfort standards to the North American uh, uh, expectations. And um, so at the end of the day, it, it was like, we didn't, like, I knew enough about, about this program to know that if I had gone just with what it said in the program without making those changes, people wouldn't have been happy because they wouldn't have accepted cooler temperatures in the winter and warmer temperatures in the summer. So that was just one thing. So this is my spaghetti work, and we're going to just break this down real quick. That looks very complicated. It's actually quite simple and quite interesting. So the Mercaz or social area, we have a commercial, in this area we have a commercial variable speed uh, ERV, energy recovery ventilator, uh, and if, if, talk to me later. It, it can deliver um, from 680 meter cubes to 3,400 meter cubes of fresh air. Um, in this area, whoop, what did I do? There, in this area here, we have CO2 monitors in the subzones, and the CO2 monitors um, allows us to use demand control ventilation. So when there's somebody, in, in, because this area here has so few people in it, or many people, or little people, we didn't know, we couldn't just kind of adjust it, right? We, we needed it to be dynamic. So we have CO2 monitors, and what that does is it puts, um, it puts the right amount of air into the right spaces so that, so that when you get large crowds in areas, you're not suffering from loss of CO2. Um, and then the, the other thing that we did, because this was our 24-7, 365 kind of unit, we did pump just a tiny bit, 255 uh, meter cubed uh, into the kitchen and the sanctuary just to keep it fresh when those spaces weren't being used. Because we reasoned that you know, when there's nobody in here using it, we didn't need to spend the energy um, uh, ventilating it or heating and cooling it because it, there's just no, no reason for it. Uh, so we just pulled off the one that was using most of the time. So there's the, there's the ERV there. Um, and this was my second use of this ERV. The first use we actually did in a school and we prototyped the ERV. We paid the people to build this thing. It had never been built before. And then, uh, and then it actually worked. So we used it again here. It's been used a few times. So um, this, this basic, old, basic system here has got this, uh, this ERV here. So you can see here, this ERV is, is, is providing us the, our, our zoned, the majority of our zoned air here. And then it pops a little bit of return and a little bit of supply just over here into this space. Um, in the sanctuary in the multipurpose room, it can be divided into three smaller spaces. Um, so what we did was we, we put three smaller ERVs in that go from uh, 150 to 1,020 meters cubed. And I know this is all engineer speak, so I'm probably boring a lot of people. I don't, too tech? No? OK. Um, and, and we can get up to uh, 3,000 meters cubed of air when we have 300 people in there. They're once again controlled by CO2 monitors, and they remain completely off until the CO2 um, uh, uh, levels reach 600 parts per million, and, and then they start going up from there. Once we get up to 1,500, it's on full blast. Um, and that's, uh, that's this unit right here, that's this unit's right here, that's this unit's right there. So these are the one and two multipurpose. And then the kitchen, the air from the sanctuary returns, there's a hallway in here and we use that as a, as a return. That returns to the kitchen space and then um, it exits out of there. Now, so what we have here is the kitchen hood. The kitchen hood, okay, is really an important piece of the equation because in passive house world, when you test your buildings, you have to depressurize and pressurize the, the building to uh, test the air tightness. Air tightness is the secret sauce of passive house. It cuts 30 to 50% of the load. 
just through the air tightness measures. So um, a commercial kitchen, of course, has a big duct of supply and a big duct of return. And in our case, we had two of them, so we had four. And so we need a way to close that off, right? Well, that was a whole thing. Um, so what we ended up doing was uh, we ended up buying a damper that was rated, UL rated, to go inside the, um, inside the ductwork that interlocked with the, with the hood. So when the hood opened, it opened the supply and opened the return dampers, and we were fine. The issue was they hadn't made one of these dampers in five years. When we spec'd what we wanted out of it, um, they sent us something that was off by, uh, we, we spec'd a 16th clearance, and they, they ended up at about a quarter inch, which we had too much air, sent it back. They sent it back again, and it was still the, you know, virtually the same thing. So then we modified it ourselves and, and made it as airtight as we could get it. Then the inspector said, you modified that yourself. It's no longer UL listed. So we sent it back and got it back. It was, it was a nightmare. Anybody wants to go. But the thing that was really cool is at the end of the day, when we tested our building, we, had, uh, we have to get under at, uh, 0.6 air changes uh, to hit our standard. At, um, with the, when, the, when, the, when the dampers were open, we were at about 2.5 air changes. When the dampers were closed, we were at about 0.5. So it worked. Now, the one thing we didn't do on this was put heat recovery on the, um, on the hood because it's not a hood that's used a lot. So we didn't worry about trying to recover that heat. In uh, commercial kitchens that are used a lot, you want to go with uh, some type of heat recovery. In general, I recommend a, a jacketed approach because it's easier to maintain than a, than, a, than a tube approach. A tube approach puts tubes actually in the airstream but it's harder to maintain with the grease. So it's easier to use a jacketed approach where you actually have a, a duct inside of a duct. Oh, there's, there's a picture of our damper. Ugh, I don't want to see it. It's bad memories from a long time ago. <laughs> um, so there's the hood right here. These are our passive vents that bring in our air. But what happens is it brings in outside air under both of these, and then it exhausts back out. So. Um, what we have for, so that was the ventilation strategy. So in Passive House, we were doing mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. Uh, an energy recovery ventilator is just like a heat recovery ventilator, but it also transfers latent or, or humidity and moisture for, from its so streams. And in Virginia, we have a lot of moisture. So we need those type of things. And then, so that's the ventilation strategy. Then we looked at supplemental heating and cooling, right? So we, with the ventilation doesn't heat and cool. Now we got to heat and cool the building. Well, our primary stage, is a water to air heat exchanger in the, e in the intake of the ERV. This is a strategy we used very successfully in the school building we did. So what we have is we have a big coil that's in an insulated box. And basically what we did, we have a glycol solution that has a passive ground loop. So what we have is a 2,000 foot of trenches with, uh, with geothermal pipe in it. And we just use that to put um, liquid through. And then that goes into the coil before the ERV. So we're preconditioning that air coming into the ERV. And then for preheating, we're using a solar thermal system. So we have a 60-tube solar thermal system that we use to heat the building. Um, the secondary stage is a 19-sear, three-ton uh, heat pump with variable spree. So what we, and there's four zones here, one, two, three, four. But the interesting thing is, for most of the year, except for when they got a lot of people in there, that initial uh, primary stage that was just using the, the low energy pump to pump the uh, the, the ground loop and the solar thermal pump to pump the heat was plenty of heat and plenty of cooling for most of the time until you got, a, in the summertime, once you got a lot of people in there, you needed the air conditioning. But the heat virtually never came on unless there was nobody in the office and it was minus 30, which is not very often in Virginia. Oh, and this is my, this is my MacGyvered. A lot of the stuff that we were doing in 10 years ago was MacGyvered. So I, I, I needed a control system to be able to control this ERV and the water coil and all that. And uh, when, I, when I put out my specs and what I was looking for, I got a price back of $15,000. And I said, I can't do that. So I went to a buddy of mine who's an electrical engineer. He said, what do you want it to do? And we wrote it all out. And then we programmed it and built it. It cost me a case of beer and the parts. <laughs> so, um, so this is our 19 SEER variable speed unit right here. This is our zones. We have one zone in the, in the, um, in the meeting area or in, the, in the, like the television hangout room. We have a zone in the offices. We have a zone in the conference room. And then we have a zone in this Merkaz or, or the sanctuary or the, uh, the lobby area is what you would call it. Um, the multi-purpose rooms uh, right here 
Um, we're using a uh, 15 sear variable speed unit. So we, you see we stepped the sear down because it's used less. Remember, remember the diagram with the big parts, you know, that, this part over here, 19 sear was what we needed because we thought we'd use more energy. 15 sear was fine in the sanctuary because we're not using it that often. Um, and uh, uh, we can get, now you can see here, we only needed three tons in that whole space of 4,000 square feet, right? But um, what, what happens here is we needed three tons in each of these spaces because of the bodies. Right? So we needed a total in this 3,000 square feet because of the occupancy and getting 300 people in there. We needed a total of uh, nine tons of cooling, which is right. That's really interesting that this massive 4,000 square foot face, space can be done with a third. And that's just because of the occupancy use and the bodies in there. Um, so when we started looking at this, now keep in mind, we built this for standard price, you know, for under 150 bucks a foot. So every single penny that was going into this, we were looking at, but you gotta remember, also, I'm an architect, I'm a builder, and I'm an energy geek. So I was doing the modeling, I was doing the costing, and I was doing the energy calculations and the pricing. So we got to go down into the very nitty gritty and say, no, we'll switch this unit for that unit, we're gonna save 1,000 here, 2,000 there. It was really like stacking pennies to get this thing built, but it was really important for me to get it built uh, because I wanted to show people what Passive House can do. So here's zone one, here's zone two, and there's zone three on the, um, on the social, social hall. The kitchen, now here we just used a builder grade 13 uh, sear three ton unit. Um, we don't, the, the kitchen's gonna be used less than 100 hours per year. So we don't anticipate this getting used very much. Um, and the energy use on this building is, is averaging about 300 bucks a month, which is nothing for an 8,000 square foot multi-use building. And that's just a simple, simple system. Um, and the difference in cost between a three ton 13 sear and a three ton 19 sear was probably back then $35,000, $4,000, which, you know, on a project over a million bucks, you know, uh, that that's maybe doesn't sound like it a lot, but when you're a builder, you know that every few thousand dollars eventually adds up to uh, something real. So this is the whole enchilada, right? The red and blue are your ventilation strategy, right? The, uh, the uh, green and, and um, the green and, wait, wait a second. Where's the green? Yeah, I'm trying to find it, the yellow. Yeah, it's orange. I've got orange and pink. Yep, orange and pink. These are your returns. It's orange. These are your supplies of the ventilation. This is your heating and cooling, and these are your returns. So blue is supply, orange, yellow, whatever that is. No, yellow is your returns. This color right here is the, is the supply of the ventilation, and this pink is your returns. There you go. But now it makes a lot more sense than the spaghetti at first. Now, huh? Same color as my shirt. Yeah, same color as my shirt. There we go. So, so the thing about this, this, um, this, this building that was so cool, it was done, it was finished in 2012. I think. So it's been operating for quite a while and it has, um, it has operated incredibly well, which proves that when you follow building physics and then, you, and then you implement the design and test and make sure that the design that you've designed is actually getting built in the field, uh, you end up with, with amazing buildings that don't have to cost anymore.